welcome everyone. We're just going to give a couple of minutes for everyone to populate the Zoom room. All right, so as you're coming in, if you don't mind opening your chat box and typing your name and what program you're joining us from this afternoon, that would be fantastic to get us started. We have a couple more people trickling in, so we'll let them come in. All right, fantastic. So welcome to day three of the Maryland Virtual Training Institute. We are so excited for you guys to be here today. And I'm already looking in the chat box and I'm seeing people from Virginia. I'm seeing people from snowy New Jersey. So welcome to all of you who are joining us from another state. We are so happy to have you. Some people from Virginia and we had earlier people from West Virginia. So what a wonderful diverse group that we have with us. So, all right, well, my name is Ellen Beatty. I'm with the Maryland Department of Labor and I am joined today by Carolina from Strong City, Baltimore. And she has some really valuable content she's gonna be sharing about um, reflecting on your own teaching. So as we get started, um, if you joined us a couple minutes late, go ahead and feel free to enter into the chat box who you are and where you're from. Just a note to remember to make sure you change that to line on the chat box to panelists and attendees so everyone can see your comments. So as we are getting started, I'm going to launch a quick poll. And that poll is gonna ask, what is your role within your program? This just gives us a little bit better of an idea who we have joining us today. All right, we have 63 participants and let's take a look at these results. We are up equally split between ABE instructors and ESL instructors. So that is a fantastic group, uh, group for here to share from Carolina about reflective teaching. All right, Carolina, if you are ready, I'm gonna kick it over to you. Awesome, thank you so much, Ellen. Uh, thank you guys so much for joining me on day three of VTI and uh, excited to have you here. Very excited that we have such an even split between ELA um, and uh, ABE instructors. I think this workshop is going to be applicable for both sides and for instructional specialists as well. So a little bit about myself before uh, we jump right in. Um, as Ellen said, my name is Carolina Belen. Um, I currently work at Strong City Baltimore Adult Learning Center as an instructional specialist with English language learners. Um, it's been uh, three years for me in that role. And before that, I was an adjunct professor um, in different ESL uh, varieties from uh, academic to, to basic to family literacy in many colleges in DMV. So um, that just tells you a little bit about where I took the inspiration for this uh, presentation. It's from my own experience and from observing my peers in those different institution and institutions and from uh, observing the teachers at the ALC at Strong City. So it's just like a collective experience that I tried to pour in and share with you guys and I hope you find it helpful. Um, so I'm going to share my screen right now. Oh, I have Ellen host disabled participant screen sharing. So I think you have to make me a- Yes, a give photo. me a second. Mm -hmm. That's okay. Okay, try one more time. Mm -hmm. Oh, here we go, perfect. Apologies. Mm -hmm. No worries. Here we go. Okay, and I just wanna make sure that I can see the chat. 
as we are um, all right as we are going to be discussing because apparently this is not and I see that my chat is being ginormous as I'm trying to pull it up but we'll see how it all turns out as we go and so let's start with this um, quotation that I have for you guys before we delve into the agenda of what we're going to do today. Um, there is this quotation that I find very significant. A teacher is one who makes himself prog progressively unnecessary. And um, I'd like you as educators to tell me what does that mean to you? Just one minute to tell me what does this quotation mean to you as an educator? I want my students to be independent learners, teaching students skills to learn on their own, teaching students how to learn in independently, student-centered classroom, empowering. Wow, wow, so many ideas, okay. Making students uh, self-sufficient, sharing knowledge, empowering students. I hope I'll get to keep this, like, I wish I could keep all these answers and write them down somewhere because there are just so many, Great explanations, self-directing learning, becoming autonomous. Uh, I see here wanting to teach a person to fish, not just to give him a fish. I love that. That is, uh, my dad used to always say that, and this is like a very cross-cultural reference. Yes, so this is what we're going to talk about today, the, how to make students independent learners, um, make them into independent learners and how to make our instructions as, as effective as we can be. So um, we are going to discuss our experience with ineffective teaching in general, but also we will take a look at um, ineffective teaching components. And most, most importantly, we're going to focus on four. Uh, teacher centeredness, avoiding informative content, teacher development stagnation and enabling students. And as we discuss those four components, um, with each one of them, we're going to investigate ways to how to diagnose them, basically know that, okay, I have a problem with that, and how to address them in our instructions. So some quick solutions that might be easily applicable and raising awareness on which one of those areas maybe I personally need to focus uh, more. Or if you're an instructional specialist, which I know some of you here are instructional specialists, maybe you notice those in your faculty members and how you could maybe help them to overcome that. So before we delve right in, I just want to tell you guys, this is, this is a moment to be a little self-critical, but it's not a moment to scrutinize yourself or be yourself over that, oh, maybe I'm doing this or that, because I, the author of this workshop, have done all of these things and uh, I'm sure many of you will, will find that applicable to yourself as well. So this is just for self-growth, self-development, but don't be overcritical or over, over judging on yourself. Um, so here we have four quotations, and those are kind of like innocent quotations that many teachers, um, many, I hear them a lot from many teachers, and, but they indicate a deeper issue. And um, what we are going to focus is those four components today, the teacher-centeredness, avoid, avoiding and favoring, development, stagnation, and enabling. Um, let's take a look at them, and I'm going to read uh, each and one of them, and you will tell me A, B, C, or D in the chat box, which issue is that quotation indicating. So I prefer to teach grammar and make students learn vocabulary at home. This teacher might have problem with what? Yes, exactly. I see a whole avalanche of bees. Yes. So, um, of course, this is avoiding and favoring content. Um, and then we have, uh, I am very helpful. When I see a student struggle with a task, I jump right in. Which one is that?
So we have a split between D, D, A, D, A, D, A, D, A. Okay, interesting, interesting. Um, so here, in my mind, it was supposed to be a D, enabling students, um, because this is a typical talk of a, of, a, of a teacher that wants to help everybody, a super helper um, that really is crossing the line to enabling. But it does show some, some of the A traits, which is teacher-centeredness as well. So I appreciate that suggestion too, but this one I meant D. Um, so let's take a, take a look at the next one. After class, I'm exhausting from all the talking. Which one would that be? Exactly. So that previous one was D. This one is 100% A. I see you guys made a, a correct selection. Um, teacher centeredness, talking a lot, quick connection, great job. And the last one, of course, we know this is going to be C, <laughs> as we know by the, um, it's the last one. I've been using the same lesson plans and the course book for the last 10 years, teacher development stagnation. So those little quotations are going to sort of guide us through this uh, presentation and workshop because we're going to lean on them to analyze some of those, um, some of those components. So the first one we're going to focus on, and I want, I want you guys to participate as much as you can in this one. Um, I prefer to teach grammar and make students learn vocabulary at home. I have two questions for you. Please respond in the chat box. Most favorite content area, least favorite content area for you. And I know we all have some, we don't have to lie to anybody. I personally love teaching vocabulary. I love teaching speaking, discussion, pronunciation, writing. I do it, but is it my favorite area? I wouldn't call it that. We all have our most and least favorite ones. Um, so go ahead and share. Let me take a look now. Okay. Reading and writing essay. Favorite. Love grammar. Hate, hate writing. Language math. Conversation. Favorite. Writing. Least favorite. Oh, I see. A, <laughs> I see we all have a similar issue. We don't really like teaching writing. Um, least favorite. Reading and writing. Mm -hmm. Least grammar, most speaking, favorite digital literacy. Oh, great. I know a lot of people that don't like teaching digital literacy. So it's great when it's your strength. Mm -hmm. Math, you know, you can, I, I'm not a math teacher, but you can also, you know, include all your favorite content areas in math and science too. Like you like algebra, you don't like geometry. Uh -huh. Academic reading is not the favorite. All right, so it just shows us that we all have those, we all have that favoritism within and it's impossible truly to like everything the same way. So it is completely fine. However, it starts to become um, an issue in your teaching style when it is consistent. So when you're consistently choosing certain parts of content and you just neglect other parts, or you just gloss over them on a on a substantial in a substantial way that is just repeated. Um, and your classes, when they're comprehensive classes and they're supposed to include all components, usually just include speaking and reading, or vocabulary and grammar, but never any speaking. Um, this is because this is starting to become an issue then. Um, and you also can sort of feel that you're doing it is is because the reason that you're avoiding these, um, these parts of um, content are because you feel like you lack knowledge in the methodology of it. So basically you don't really know how to teach them well, so you are not doing it at all. Um, and maybe you also find them boring, they're unstimulating, you don't get the same uh, participation when you, for example, teach reading, when you get the, when you, for example, teach vocabulary and they love it and then you're trying to teach grammar and they're just like bored. So you find those, those content areas boring, therefore you just not include them. But we can do things to fix that, of course. And uh, the first one would be, I have the same situation with writing, teaching writing. Teaching academic writing was something that I found that I just lack proper knowledge in 
or maybe I just didn't feel confident teaching it because I didn't have great results with students that I was teaching it to. So first one was to confront my insecurity. Why? Where is it coming from? Why do I not like teaching that part? Why do I not like teaching grammar? Is it because I think it's boring? Well, maybe because the, the, the way how I learned it was sort of boring and repetitive. Um, is it because I feel like I need to take more professional development on the topic? It's important to confront it of why you don't like to include these parts um, in your delivery. And then researching and engaging meta method of delivering it and adapting it to your favorite teaching method. So if you like to have discussions, why not have it about grammar? And if you like to for your students to quiz a lot, you can find the way to do it with academic writing. So basically having your favorite method of delivering it and adapting it to the content um, can really, really help for you to like it more, therefore for you to introduce it more and your students to benefit from it. And sometimes if you feel like, okay, I'm not an expert in ESL, especially, we have all these topics that we're teaching, medicine, um, law, government, sometimes we are not qualified enough to teach them everything about everything. So it is important to have that uh, knowledge which external sources you can use in order to provide them with the best content you can. The next one, teacher centeredness, that's a huge one. I think one of the biggest ones that I've observed in my time as an instructional specialist and the quotation that would um, indicate that would be after class, I'm exhausted from all the talking. And um, also I would like to add exhausted from all the talking and exhausted with your wrist from all the writing. Because I've noticed that the teachers that have high teacher centeredness, they talk and they write and they perform and they're exhausted. So I want you guys to tell me what is your percentage of teacher talk time? Ellen is going to launch a poll right now um, and you have to just think about it. Nobody's obviously measuring you, but you can choose which one is your, your bracket. Less than 20%, 20%, 30, 40, 50, more than 50. And, you know, obviously this is anonymous, so nobody's judging you. Tell us how it is, and we're going to discuss these results soon. Okay, all right, let's take a look at the results. I see, okay, the, the biggest, uh, the majority of you uh, selected 40%, 50% um, a good amount too, only 5% for less than 20, uh, 20, 30, 40, 50 are, 30 and 40 are the majority of votes. Now, um, I want you guys to tell me from your knowledge, from some external sources, you can put it in the chat box. What do you think or what have you heard is the perfect ratio of the teacher talk time? Have you heard? You can put it in the chat box. 30%, 20%, 20, 30, 40. 30, okay, not sure. All right, haven't heard. Well, wow, I, I'm glad so I can <laughs> give you that piece of knowledge. So from uh, many sources, and um, if you want me to follow up with them, I sure can uh, later on. Um, it is between 20 and 30. It is between 20 and 30 that is the golden ratio of teacher talk time. So if you put yourself in that uh, 33, oh, very specific. Um, if you put yourself in that uh, bracket of 20 or 30, um, you can be very much proud of yourself because this is the golden ratio. However, I have noticed that for distance learning, the teacher talk times goes up a little bit. And uh, I've noticed that also it goes up for very beginning levels. However, we should still always strive for that 20 to 30 golden ratio. So if you're at 40, that, that just means that you don't have a whole lot to fight. So you can also give yourself... Uh, a big thumbs up because 40 is a is a very decent um, ratio that you could be at. So not a whole lot of work ahead. Let's take a look for some, oops, back. 
for some awareness um, on teacher centeredness. So basically, if if you feel like your throat and your vocal cords are killing you after your two hour class, then it should not be like that. Uh, this is a huge red flag that you're doing something wrong because uh, I said that repeatedly um, to my instructors, our vocal cords are our most precious instrument as, as instructors and we should be respecting it. So if you're tired from talking, you've probably been talking too much. And the same with your wrist from writing. And when you treat your students more like an audience versus participants, which I notice that there is many instructors that they feel like they have to, it comes from a good place of heart when you feel like you have to just give them everything you have, you treat them like this audience, you notice that there is no interaction between the students and there are certain students that, the ones maybe that don't have a whole lot of proclivity to talk, they've been silent the whole class, then this is the problem of teacher-centeredness. And it, it's it's kind of weird in nature because when you are a teacher that's that's centered, let's say you don't really feel like you're noticing it, but for a person that's evaluating you, like an instructional specialist or a peer that is, is sitting there or students, it's very apparent when the teacher is, um, is not having a student-inclusive and student-centered classroom. And, and I would say that the problem is when you are talking consistently more and the students. So over 50, 60 percent, this is going to be an area of, this should be an area of focus of improvement. And I think this is because we, um, many times we are so focused on delivering content that we forget about the practice and, and forgetting about the group work. And this is where it's stemming from most of the time, the content delivery. While we know that there are so many sources of content delivery right now that we as teachers are more facilitators than content providers. Super easy tips for success would be lower your teacher talk time, and it sounds very vague, lower your teacher talk time, but um, it really is focusing on how much you talk. If you don't have to talk, do you, do you have to, right? So making group work a, a, a priority, giving voice uh, to students, making them group leaders, changing it up, giving them that assigned time to talk so you don't have to, um, really decreases that teacher talk time. Um, interactive online practice, such as using chat, polling, annotation. Oh, I see some comments here. I'm really excited to check that. Also, I teach a pronunciation class, and I found that I feel I need to talk more than in my regular reading speaking class. Yeah, but with pronunciation, I feel like it's you're modeling the sounds. So maybe you're a little excused on that, unless it's just the talking and not just the sounds. And I've got curriculum with writing models, paragraphs, students, style. Yeah, that's that's a great idea to, to include that. If you guys want to write some comments, I'm you know, very ready to read them aloud as well. And um, so interactive online practice on Zoom, there is such a variety of things that you can do so you don't have to talk. So um, even using, ex um, I'm forgetting what's the name of that, but you know, the little emojis with thumbs up and clap, um, that is also giving them a room to express themselves and lower your teacher talk time, give, give that attention to them. And including everybody, that's a cliche, but it's, uh, it's the one that really um, rings a bell because making sure that each student, even the most quiet one, had at least a little bit of something to say and making it a priority. I remember that uh, when I started and and I started as a teacher and I had a teacher, uh, older teacher evaluate me and they told me, you know what, Carolina, you're really trying, but you're trying so hard that you're doing all the work for them and you're just, it's being a little teacher centered. Make sure everybody talks. So I had a small class, it was only eight people, but I would have them written down in my notebook and I would put little dots every time they spoke. So include and making sure that each person had a bunch of dots on them. So I know that I really included everybody. Um, and there's many, many ways that you can make sure that you included everybody. I see some. Uh, TTT is teacher talk time. Yes, just to make sure that we all understand the abbreviation. 
And I have should students who are beyond learning style go into a separate breakout room and begin their own writing. Um, I think if you can pop into their breakout rooms because you can as a host, I, I don't see why not. Um, and practicing patience. This is also um, like a vague expression, but a lot, of, a lot of people in general, we have anxiety and we have anxiety of silence. And when we hear that there is nobody talking and nobody answering our question right away, we feel that ball in our stomach just saying, say something, say something, say something. Um, and then you start talking and then you're bringing up your teacher talk time. So practicing patience as a teacher, waiting for them to take turns and taking turns, teacher, then them, then them, then them again, then you. This really having that in your mind as your teacher class, the patience part really helps um, to make the, the class uh, much more student centered. I see more, um, more comments here. Mm -hmm. Thoughts on calling on students for their answers, even the shyer ones. I am personally uh, a fan of that. I do like to um, call out students for their answers, but not, not just like, I let everybody speak and then, but you didn't speak, so you speak now. So if I do it, I do it for everybody. So like, can Jose answer now or can Maria answer now? And, and I do it for the whole activity when I assign the answer to the question, the responder to the question. And then I'll have uh, an open-ended question that I'm just waiting for volunteers to answer. So I just stick to activity. If I, if I assign, then I assign for this whole activity. And if I don't, and I leave it open-ended, then I leave it open-ended to everybody and then I don't single them out. But yes, I, I am a fan of, it's not a forced thing because they choose to participate in the class, but to assign certain questions to, to students, yes. This is my personal opinion. Hmm, I see, I call on students, including shy ones. Mm -hmm. Thanks for, mm -hmm. great. All right, um, let's take a look at the next one. Next one is enabling students. Um, and the quotation that indicates that very well is, I'm very helpful. When I see students struggle with a task, I jump right in. And when we say that, and we say that a lot as teachers, we think we're so helpful and so great because we want so badly, we want them to learn, we care so much. And I know that comes from like a really good place in our, in our teachers' hearts, but Sometimes the harder thing to do is to let go and let them do and make mistakes than help them. So I want you guys to tell me right now in the chat box, when you have a student that puts their hands like that and says, I don't know how to do this, one sentence, how do you address that? One sentence. Really interested in what you guys want to tell me about that. We walk through steps together. Have you tried? Let me show you how. I asked the peer if he can explain. Talk to your peers. Mm -hmm. Look at the examples we did. Ask your neighbor. Mm -hmm. I see a lot of you guys are in favor of including another student into the problem solving. It's okay to make mistakes. Mm -hmm. Scaffolding. Solving to, so you are solving together, okay. Mm -hmm. Prerequisite lessons or notes. Let me see what you don't understand. Which part is difficult? So asking more specifically. Who can assist? Mm -hmm. Thank you guys all, um, for all these responses. I see all of you are really trying to address the issue. Oh, more. I'm really curious. I ask question, ask your partner, look at your notes, look at the book, then I might help guide them to help them figure it out. Okay, so it's a process. I really like, Patricia, yes, I really like how in depth you went with all that. Okay, let's take a look at diagnostics criteria. Do you have problem with that as a teacher? And uh, so I told you guys, I've had problems with all of these. But um, enabling, this is something I've struggled with for a while. And I think I have mastered it, but it's, 
it uh, it took a little bit. So when you're over explaining, you're you're over explaining is over explaining is when you are starting somewhere and you're going way beyond the, what you intended at the beginning. So or you're explaining the same thing over and over and over in the large audience. Um, so when you're over explaining and when you're giving students answers or helping them instead of guiding them how to do it themselves. And I think a big enabling um, that's in the ESL classroom, I personally don't ever let um, my students use a translator or a phone. Um, this is a huge no-no for me. I don't know if you guys agree or not. You can tell me in the chat box. Um, I know calculator and math, it's, it's, you know, when you're at the higher level of math, it's not really enabling because they're using it to create something bigger. But um, on the foundation level, I think calculator also is an enabler. Um, let me see what you guys think. I see my chat. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you guys agree, right? Um, so giving them that crutch of a translator um, or allowing them to use it, you know, you're kind of turning a blind eye. I set it up personally, very straight, very strict rules about using phones and translators. Um, so this is because it's very enabling and it's counterproductive. Um, and then the last one is when you find yourself giving, you know, those students that struggle a lot of one-on-one -on -one time during your class time, uh, disproportionately more one-on-one -on -one time instead of teaching the class, then you're enabling this one student and neglecting the others. Uh, and I know this is very, very difficult because, you know, differentiation of instruction is important. Um, but there's, there's, again, a thin line uh, between helping and enabling. And if you find yourself on that second, beyond, you know, over that line, over that fence, there's a couple of things you can do. Uh, now, let me, I'm going to be periodically checking the chat box. Um, Somebody says that they're over explained to over explained too much when they were a new teacher. Mm -hmm. Yes, I find um, enabling uh, very characteristic to new teachers who have so much enthusiasm and passion and dedication, and they just they just want to their students to learn so badly that sometimes they they want it more than the students themselves. So um, I completely agree with that. Mm -hmm. Dictionary. So dictionary and translator, I um, there's a difference for me. Dictionary, I think, sort of fosters learning because all the work that you have to do when finding the word, you, know, you, you, know, you practice the alphabet skills, all the work that you put in into finding that word makes you remember the word. But translator, like a Google Translate, I'm, I'm a game. Um, Tech devices are allowed, okay, mm -hmm. for health problems. Well, of course, you know, guys, you all have to figure out which um, instruction styles works for best, best for you and for your students. I uh, make my own rules, you make your own rules. And um, if you would like to share with us, how do you think maybe translator could be beneficial um, for students to learn? Then I would love to hear that as well. Um, now let's take a look at some tips for some success. And um, the biggest one that I found is um, effective is to recommend resources and to follow up. So when a student has a problem, uh, you give them a certain amount of resources and how to use them, make sure they're familiar. And then you follow up if they actually use them. Because it's sort of easy to, you know, for us to throw the resources and be just like, bye, got the resources, you're good now but actually follow up, hey, did you read it? What did you find out from this? Do you feel like you're more secure learning that right now? Do you still feel more resources? Do you like you need more resources? So the follow up part is very important. Um, and, okay, I see flexible deadlines. Yes, that's, I'm going to talk about that as well. Um, so limiting uh, outside A's during class time, I, I talked about how I find that very beneficial for my personal non-enabling style. However, I do know that you can use, you know, devices in more creative ways. Um, but I think that outside aids during class time really helps with limiting enabling students. Tutoring is an amazing resource that many colleges and many institutions offer and not many students 
maybe not many, but not always the students that need to uh, take advantage of that. And um, just knowing that you are the instructor for the larger group does not make you the student's uh, personal tutor as well, because there are resources that this person could use to address those certain gaps in knowledge. So really advocating for tutoring is a great thing that an instructor could do. Documenting achievements is uh, incredible for those students that really have, um, are prone to doubting themselves and they doubt themselves a lot. And uh, when you bring them back to the achievements that they've documented, it really helps them look at it in perspective and give them that strength to do things on their own, to do things on their own. And uh, the biggest one, another phrase is empower, not enable. So just like somebody said in that first quotation that we discussed, the, the fish giving um, is not great, but the fishing rod or the fishing skills, there's a completely different story. So this is the difference between empowering and not enabling. Um, and it's a thin line. Um, I see tutoring really makes a difference. Mm -hmm. Limited time, yes, of course, limited time has always been in adult ed, it's one of the biggest hurdles. So then resources become even more valuable for students to use at their flexible time and for them to have those flexible deadlines as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you guys so much for participating in that discussion. And let's take a look at the last one. You guys know which one it is. Teacher development stagnation. And um, the quotation I have with it is, I have been using the same lesson plan, this, I have been using the same lesson plans and a course book for the last 10 years. And um, Ellen, if you could please launch a poll, I want to ask you guys, what influences the change in my instruction delivery? What makes me change as an instructor? What influences my growth the most? When I take a look at myself as a teacher and think, okay, this needs to change, this needs to change, I want to implement this, I want to implement that. What is it that is the most appealing to you? We have professional development, peer observation, supervisor evaluation suggestions. So if you have an instructional specialist or program director, formally evaluate your class. Um, my own research, such as watching blogs, YouTube channels, reading some articles, being in uh, maybe some groups on, on social media that share resources, or maybe just observing students react to what I implement and how and kind of trial and mistake. Oh, very interesting. Um, so I see professional development and observing the students react are in the lead. Um, and the three others, peer observation, supervisor, and uh, my own research are in a similar category. Okay, that's great to know um, The professional development has such an influence. I, I would figure because guys, you're all here in VTI, so I'm sure professional development is very important to you. And um, so it's easy for you to, uh, to avoid this teacher development stagnation. It's, it's a common thing and it's, it's real. So, you know, the, the fact that you're here means that you're at least fighting it or maybe you don't have a problem with it at all. Um, but if you feel like you're doing it, it's, it would be that moment that you can't remember when was the last time you did something new in class and willingly. Um, and uh, maybe you've been using the same websites all the time or the same methods or the same resources. And routine is important in classroom, but routine also gives you the wiggle room to introduce something new every time. So having a certain things that you always do, but maybe you know, you always start with a warm-up activity, but it doesn't have to always be the same warm-up activity. It can be something different every time. So when you can't remember when was the last time you did something different, then it's probably the stagnation creeping in. Uh, somebody that doesn't seek or participate in professional development, um, and they think that, you know, the way they are shaped as a teacher, it's okay, and 
they'll continue to be like that for the rest of their career. And um, when a person, one person's class becomes predictable, and you see that with time, those same methods seem to fade with effectiveness, and um, it's time for a little change. And the most importantly, this is like this feeling that you have internally that and I'm sure we've all been there at least one or two times when we have this feeling like maybe I'm not enjoying this as much as I used to. This is the time. Uh, this is that feeling that should give you that kick. OK, time for something new. You have to keep your students entertained with your class, engaged, focused, entertained, participating. But you need to yourself also be entertained and and you have to enjoy it, and uh, you have to feel like you're growing because um, you know you're providing them with your energy, with your you're stimulating them intellectually. So you need to be stimulated as well. And for that, that um, stagnation is really important to avoid. I see a couple of uh, chat comments here. Oh, certificate of completion. Of course, I I'm sure that VTI will be able to. Take care of that. Um, okay. Let's take a look at what can we do. And guys, whenever you feel like you have other tips of what can you do, please feel free to share. Number one, get, uh, get involved in professional development. So thank you so much for being here. Uh, you're fighting your stagnation actively. Um, and uh, there are so many amazing opportunities currently due to everything being distanced that uh, it's never been easier, really, to participate in professional development. So really encourage that. And trying to keep your class entertaining. Peer observation is really important. Um, one of the biggest perks for me when I became an instructional specialist is to see all of these amazing teachers in action. And I, I, I always tell them I'm super privileged because I take all those little things that I see in, in them, I still teach one class. So, uh, and I implement that into my instruction and I feel so blessed that I get to observe all of them as a part of my job. But I know, um, I know almost every college that I've worked at, they encourage peer observation. Many, many colleges compensate for peer observation as a part of professional development. And it's an underused, um, option, I think. I think we should do peer observation way more because as adult learners, we learn from each other. So um, really, you can you can get so much out of it. And finding a mentor that is useful for every career path, I think. Um, somebody that you really admire as a teacher and just want to learn from them. Uh, teacher journaling is something that I found myself very uh, effective. And that doesn't have to mean that after every class you say, dear diary, I had an amazing class. It's more like what you did, right? Just keeping your lesson plans, basically keep them in a big binder. And once a year, take a look. Oh, these are the methods that I was using this year. Maybe I should implement that again. Or maybe, oh, or look how much I've grown. Oh, I used to do all these quizzes and now I do everything in Kahoot. So it's nice to kind of reflect on seeing you grow throughout the times. And teacher journaling is very, very just um, useful with that. And of course, all those resources that are out there right now, your favorite blogs, your favorite YouTube channels, platforms, um, groups, Pinterest boards. Um, there is so many that we can share with each other that uh, we can continue growing just from getting all this outside um, input from the blogs and, and all the internet internet ESL and ABE sphere that's out there. And let me take a look at um, what you guys are writing here in the chat box. Yes, so starting the teacher journaling, getting feedback from students. That's a great approach, actually. Thank you so much. Uh, I think I might have to include that in my alter presentation, getting feedback from students. Eureka, yes, great idea. They will tell you what works on them, of course. Any other ideas for you guys to um, work on teacher's technician? And student feedback. Well, this is why I like doing these uh, sort of presentations with a lot of people because it helps me 
uh, to learn from you guys as well. So this is a space to share with everybody whatever you think on how to address these, these issues. Okay, now take a second to think about, we have these four again, which one is your uh, personal area of improvement? Um, which one is the one that you think you should now focus on the most that when we were talking about the little diagnostic of I have a problem with that and um, which one kind of rang bell and was like, okay, yeah, this is me. Um, and we are going to launch a poll to see which ones you guys identify yourself with the most. And I'm going to take a look at this chat in the meantime. Students evaluating their own learning. I think that's a great way to self-assess to see Eileen is mentioning that. Talking about current events. <clears throat> you guys don't have to, you can share, you know, one of your those uh, uh, air, personal areas of improvement in chat box if you want to, but this is uh, anonymous, so you can keep it to yourself, you can keep it in your brain and be like, okay, this is something that I need to pay special attention to from now on. Um, as I said, for me, throughout my teaching years, um, it's been uh, enabling that I've been battling, that inner urge that you are there to help them and fix everything. Um, Currently, I think it's switched a little bit to avoiding in favorite content for me, just because with digital learning, there are certain areas of content that are much more difficult to introduce than um, it was in the in-person classroom. So this is the one I will be focusing now, trying to find some ways to um, include every content area that I can. Oh, I see we're all in the same boat. Uh, enabling students at 42% and then um, almost even breakup between teacher-centeredness, avoiding and favoring, and teacher development stagnation. Um, it's, thank you guys so much for voting. And, um, oh, let me see. There's more. And um, if you would like to comment on that uh, or share with us um, enabling students, I see. If you want to share more ideas on how to improve those four, um, those four, how do I call it? Please help me. Uh, problem areas. Um, there's way more, of course, that there can be as teachers, but um, if you have any more ideas and you would see uh, yourself contributing to this presentation, because I would like it to grow. This is just the beginning for me. There's, I, I would love to make a whole teacher of reflection um, course, let's say. So I would love for you to reach out to me at kbellen, strongcitybaltimore.org, if you would like to contact me, if you would like the slides, uh, or you'd like to talk about this topic, I find it very interesting, um, or contribute to what I've already created, um, please email me. Um, this is a, a second for you to... Uh, write down my email or copy it or I'm sure it will be available later and for me to catch up on chat and say thank you so much for uh, participating and um, I loved your guys um, input how everybody just had so many ideas oh thank you so much oh, I appreciate that you guys uh, enjoyed yourself and uh, have a great afternoon Four thank areas of mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Carolina, so much. What a fantastic presentation that really asks us to reflect on ourselves. 
So thank you everyone for attending. I'm going to post two links in the chat box right now. The first is the feedback survey for the Virtual Training Institute in this session. Um, feedback survey. You, will, you can click this link or you will also be prompted to complete the survey when you exit the Zoom room. The second link that I'm gonna to present to you is the proof of participation format we would ask that you only do one proof of participation after you've completed all the sessions this week uh, to make it slightly easier on my team and I. So thank you so much for participating, Carolina. That was such fantastic information. I, I hope you're seeing all the thank yous and all the wonderful um, complimentary yeah. comments in the uh, chat box. Thank you so much. It makes me very happy, obviously. <laughs> Well, thank you so much. We couldn't do this without you. And for the rest of you, there's a three o'clock session today. And then we do hope that you join us tomorrow morning. We have a full morning of sessions tomorrow. So thank you so much for your participation. Carolina, thank you so much for presenting to the Virtual Training Institute. Have a thank you, Ellen, for facilitating. Of course, my pleasure.